The Realms of Conquest book series is about the world's only magical kingdom in their quest for peace. Paperback and ebook available on Amazon.com or check out the free video book on YouTube. That's R-E-A-L-M-I-C. Brian Robinson, Daily Writing Resilience, 365 Meditations and Inspirations for Writers. Whether you're a seasoned author or an aspiring scribe, chances are you've grappled with your share of rejection. Literary agents say the number one key to writing success, even more important than good writing, is perseverance in the face of disappointment. Daily Writing Resilience provides advice, inspiration, and techniques to help you turn roadblocks into stepping stones. You'll find tips and support through exercises such as meditation, breath work, yoga, stress management, gratitude, decluttering, sleep, exercise, mindful eating, and more. These 365 meditations will help you navigate the ups and downs of your writing life, creating positive habits that will guide you toward a more rewarding experience. Book lovers unite! I'm Demetrius Jackson, and you're listening to the Chapter One Podcast. The greatest stories ever written all begin with Chapter One. In each episode, our guest authors will share their first chapters with you. When speaking with authors, we often try to demystify the writing process by revealing tips and suggestions that help that author to finish their book in hopes that there's something said that can help or inspire you, the listener, in getting through your own writing endeavors. Well, today's entire episode is dedicated to my fellow authors and aspiring writers. On this episode, I'll be speaking with an author who often applies his decades of psychotherapy experience to help writers overcome setbacks and basically just stay positive and productive. That author is Brian Robinson. He's a prolific writer who has at least 35 books last I counted. He's been featured on 2020, Good Morning America, ABC World News Tonight, and now he's on the Chapter One podcast. In his new book, Daily Writing Resilience, Brian provides advice, inspiration, and techniques to help turn your writing roadblocks into stepping stones. These techniques, or meditations as he calls them, can help you navigate the ups and downs of the writing practice and help you create positive habits. So I'm ecstatic that Brian will be sharing some of those tips with us today. And it starts right now. When you started writing on a regular basis, did you think it would answer all your prayers for fame and wealth and you'd live happily ever after? Did you dream your book would be on bookstore shelves beside Lee Child, James Patterson, or J.K. Rowling? That it would hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list and garner the Edgar, the Barry, the Agatha, and Thriller Awards? That Steven Spielberg would beat down your door to sign you for the screenplay? I did. Were you perplexed to discover that nightmares come with the dreams? Did an agent's rejection publish your expectation? blistering reviews, no-shows at bookstore signings, deadline pressures, zero awards, or agonizing writer's block besiege you? Did you have trouble locating your book on the shelves at Barnes & Noble? Did you make a little money, but not enough to pay off the mortgage? Did you find that what few bucks you earned had to go toward paying a publicist? And are you still waiting for Hollywood to call? Well, I am. After Dash Dreams, do you still love to write? I do. Writers like me with ink in their blood have to write. Not writing isn't an option. When the going gets rough, we persevere through literary storms, albeit bruised, bereft, and beleaguered. I've seen them, writers frazzled from publishing's frenetic pace, spirits dead from unfulfilled and stressful career demands, empty shells comatose like zombies moving among the living. The dead aren't supposed to walk among us, but they do. I know they do. I was one of them too. In the still lonely hours before dawn, I plopped into the armchair, elbows digging into the knees of my ripped jeans. I dropped my head into my hands, grabbed a fistful of hair and wept. 
That's right, this grown man cried. After finishing my best mystery yet, or so I thought, an editor I'd hired tore the plot to shreds. Rewrite after rewrite, dead end after dead end. Confusion and frustration mired me. I wailed at the clock and shook my fist at the heavens, cursing, slamming things. At every turn, I met one roadblock after another. Distraught, I didn't know what else to do but cry. I was my own biggest enemy suffering from drywell syndrome and didn't have a clue. Keep in mind, this wasn't my first book. I had written 35 nonfiction and fiction books, tons of magazine and journal articles, blogs and book chapters. I even won a few writing awards along the way, but I had never encountered that degree of writer's hell. But hell is a state of mind. In the words of 17th century author John Milton, the mind is a universe and can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. Truth be told, you and I make our own writer's hell or heaven. I can hear you gasp and see you roll your eyes, but listen up before you befriend me. Agents, editors, critical reviewers, or publishing houses don't hold the writing chains that bind us in place. We do. Unwittingly, perhaps, but we can rise up, overthrow our master, and unbind ourselves. And that's what this book's about. Ask not how your writing life is treating you. Ask how you're treating your writing life. By now, you might wonder if it's possible to sustain joy, perseverance, and peace of mind in a hectic career filled with constant uncertainty and disillusionment. I'm here to tell you that it is. Like any profession, writing has its challenges, heartbreaks, frustrations, and exhilarations. Chances are, whether you're a seasoned author or an aspiring scribe, you've grappled with your share of meteoric challenges, repeated rejection, major setbacks, and devastating heartbreak. However, literary agents say the number one key to writing success, even more important than good writing, is perseverance, dogged determination in the face of disappointment. For many years in my lectures, books, and media appearances, I've taught people around the world techniques of resilience in the face of challenges and how to turn roadblocks into stepping stones. Just as grass grows through concrete, a resilient zone exists inside you. Once you find that place, you realize the power within you is greater than the challenges before you. The 365 daily meditations in this book begin with January and go through December, but you can start at any time during any month. So if you pick up the book in May, you don't have to wait until January to start. The index provides keywords that allow you the flexibility to select a particular writing issue that you might want to contemplate. You can select writing topics listed there that resonate on any particular day or certain topics of your choice in more depth. The readings are designed to support authors of all genres. Perhaps you're one of them, juggling a full-time job, children, marriage, and household chores with a daily writing regimen and pressures from the business side of writing. As you navigate the ups and downs of the tumultuous writing world, this book will help you step back, take a breath, and contemplate a tried, and true message geared to foster conscious living and free you from the clutches of your writing woes. An impossible deadline, a lousy review, bad writing habits, an agent's blundering rejection, an editor's volcanic blast of disparagement, impassable writer's block, sounds of crickets at book signings, and the seismic rumble of your own spewing torrent of self-doubt. Plenty of books teach the craft of writing, but this is the only guide on the craft of writing resiliency necessary for you to become a successful author. You'll find tips and support through exercises such as meditation, breath work, yoga practices, the mind-body connection, stress management and relief practices, shifting habits for gratitude and positivity, decluttering to remove stuck energy, and a self-care for health through sleep, exercise, and mindful eating. Daily contemplation provides reflection and mindfulness practices that will help you find your present moments and live more consciously through your writing pursuits. 
The simple messages in these daily readings have nourished and supported me, kept me resilient, and added meaning and joy to my own mindful writing journey. Each daily meditation begins with a quotation from all types of writers, comics, novelists, poets, psychologists, cartoonists, spiritual leaders, journalists, songwriters, or philosophers who serve up bite-sized kernels of wisdom. Each quotation is followed by a passage of sage advice, warm-hearted humor, concise heart speak, and touching inspiration. You can digest the morning meditation with a hot beverage, then tuck it away to apply during your writing day, or use it as a devotional to contemplate before falling asleep. Each reading concludes with a one-sentence takeaway that lodges within you, eventually becomes a part of you, living and breathing inside, and helping you navigate the ups and downs of daunting writing challenges. At the conclusion of this book, I show you how I broke free from my inner chains, got unstuck, and finished that murder mystery. Meanwhile, I hope these daily meditations summon your inner resilience to escort you through the writing days ahead, support you in a deeply meaningful and mindful way, and help you bring you the writing fulfillment you've been seeking. When Sarah sent me your book, I must have read your introduction at least five times. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. You captured the essence of the writer's struggle. Oh, well, thank you. The amount of rejection that you face as an author can, as you know, just be stifling. And even when you begin finding success, I don't know if the rejections ever really go away. Perhaps they just I don't know, change form over time, or at least that's my author experience. Well, you know, you're right. And I've talked to a lot of uh, well-known uh, mystery writers, mainly. That's what, that's what I write fiction around mystery and thriller. And uh, actually, the ones who've had success with their first book will often, there's something called sophomore slump. Mm -hmm. And it's the second book. And the fear is it won't be as good as the first. Yeah. So this self-doubt stays with writers. I think it's just a part of our DNA. The key is we learn to not let it get in the way. And it's, it, you know, Babe Ruth once said, every time I strike out, it brings me closer to my next home run. Mm -hmm. And that's the mindset we have to have as writers. Every rejection we get just makes us stronger if, if we're willing to let it do that and can bring us further along if we walk around it or over it and don't let it stop us. And the most important thing is when we get rejected, don't reject ourselves because many of us do. Mm -hmm. We uh, kick ourselves around or berate ourselves. The key is to put our arm around ourselves and say, hey, this is not the end of the road. I don't have to give up. It's never the end until we throw in the towel. And instead of throwing in the towel, we take that towel, wipe the sweat off our brow and keep on going. That's, that's what a successful writer is. You have to have that resilience and persistence. Yes, absolutely. And I think your book does a fantastic job of doing that, which is why I was really happy to speak with you. Being Appreciate able to that. help writers to find that acceptance or, or maybe even that mm -hmm. peace to keep pushing forward. Yeah. And you know, this is true with any obstacle in life. And we've all experienced obstacles. The key is to be able to ask yourself, what? how can I make this work for me? What can I learn from this? How can I get smarter or stronger? And that's the key because it's those challenges or obstacles that make us stronger. If we're willing to look at it that way and to use that information to overcome whatever the obstacle is. So I think the main question that people would want to know is how does your writing book differ from the numerous ones that are out there already? And I will say that there are some distinct differences, you know, such mm -hmm. as your formatting and yeah. <laughs> even the Zen like feeling you get as you're reading these daily meditations. But how would you say your book is different? Well, it's the only daily meditation book that I know of. You know, a lot of us at the first of the year make these resolutions and they somehow in two or three months have fallen by the wayside. Mm -hmm. But what this book does, it gives you an injection every day of positivity and resilience and, and it encourages folks to keep going, whether it's writing or a lot of people are saying with this book, anybody can use this book because it's about, you know, living life fully. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so it's the only book that, that does that. There, most of the books on writing are about craft, right. which is great, but we, we needed this book and that's why I wrote it because I couldn't find anything that helped me get through my own writer's block when I had it. So I wrote my own. Each day, uh, starts with a quote from a famous writer. Uh, I'm looking right now at April 17th, and the quote is by Maya Angelou, and, and it's called Outlast Defeat. Okay, so Maya Angelou says, In fact, it may be necessary to encounter the defeats so you can know who you are, what you can rise from, how you can still come out of it. I love that because basically what she's saying is it's sometimes facing defeat or challenge or rejection teaches us how strong we are on the inside. And one of the things I've discovered is that the power within us is stronger than the obstacles outside of us that we face. Oh, absolutely. Most of us don't know that. But you can find that out, and when you discover that, it's palpable, it's organic. Yeah. And it helps you face anything in life fearlessly. Yeah. Yeah, I think Probably one of the biggest challenges of not even just writers, but just people in general is just overcoming that voice in your head. They call it imposter mm-hmm. syndrome. Yes. <laughs> Which seems to be a reoccurring theme <laughs> that appears on this show often. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I've noticed, a lot of high achieving people have the imposter syndrome. But if you know that it's a common thing and it's only, a, as you say, a voice in the head, it's not who we are. It's that critical voice that we all have if we're creators, if we're artists. And what we learn to do is listen to it and watch it. Don't let it blend with us. Don't believe it. Don't let it uh, take over who you are. One of the things I do with that voice when it comes up, if I'm writing or trying to do something that's challenging, I, I just talk to it. Hmm. And I say, yeah, I know you think that, and it's okay for you to think that, but I'm going to go ahead and do this anyway because I think I'm going to be able to do it. And... Basically, if you do that, the voice will, over time, start to relax more, and you won't hear it as much. It loses if we, power. we don't want to fight it or try to get rid of it, it, it's really about befriending it and not believing it, because it usually doesn't tell us the truth. Mm-hmm. And I also see what you're doing with that technique, is that you're putting a separation between you and the voice. That's right. That's the key. Mm-hmm. We call it, in therapy, here's where the psychotherapy comes in, we call that unblending. Mm. Because if if I have a critical voice in my head, I'm I'm, I'm going to tend to believe it's true. Like let's say I'm going to go do a presentation to a thousand people, and the voice says you can't do that, or you're going to screw up, or you're going to not be able to answer questions, or and then if it is blended with me, I'm going to say, oh my gosh, why am I doing this? Oh, what am I going to do? But if I separate from it and I listen to it. I realize it's not really telling me the truth because there are many times I've done this and done it well. And I think a lot of the listeners can identify with that, whether it can be anything presenting to your colleagues at work or going to a party where you don't know anybody. Uh, that voice wants to keep us safe. Believe it or not, it's a survival part of us that it keeps us stuck. Yes. So that's why we have to separate from it or unblend with it. I was curious about that. When did you practice psychology? Was it before, during, or after you became an author? Well, it was before, during, and after. I'm still doing it. (laughs) Right on. I have a private practice, um, and I have had for for many, many years, and I taught at the University of North Carolina for many years. I taught counseling, trained counselors. Uh, Now what I do is uh, I write four days a week, and I go to my practice three days a week. That sounds like the life right there. I love it. It's a great balance. (laughs) This may perhaps be a broad question, but in what ways did you incorporate your psychotherapy experience into your book, or or how do you use it to help writers? Well, the main thing I've done is there's a lot of cutting-edge research in neuroscience coming out, and I've taken a lot of that neuroscience that we use with people who've been traumatized or who are under stress. And I use it with writers because we writers uh, are under a lot of stress, whether you're beginning, in the middle, or even if you're seasoned. If you want to publish, for example, and all writers don't, but if you want to publish, it's incredibly competitive and people will tell you no every step of the way. So 
I'll give you an example of some of the science that, that I have in the book that's helpful. One of the things is called a negativity bias. And scientists have discovered that we all tend to see the negative side of something instead of the positive. The reason is that if, if we're looking for a problem or, or how to fix something, it helps us survive. If we don't worry and, and if we don't look at the negative, we can be extinguished. So the whole idea is if something uncertain or that we've never done before is looming, the needle tends to fall in the negative direction. In other words, the mind is Teflon for positivity and it's Velcro for negativity. Yeah, that makes a lot now, of sense. Once you know that, that we overestimate uh, negativity, then you learn to not let that little voice in your head have too much power. And we learn to underestimate the threat and overestimate our ability to handle it. And so that's what some of the readings are about, is to pay attention to how you're thinking about this upcoming challenge, this writing or whatever the challenge is. And usually, by default, we go to the negative, which is usually not accurate. Mm -hmm. You know, when we stick our neck out and go through whatever that challenge is, we find it, it wasn't that bad at all. Things are never as bad as our voice tells us that they're going to be. Right. So the neuroscience is one thing. The, the whole idea of self-compassion, which also there's a lot of research going on about self-compassion and the importance of that and how that helps us accomplish. One example would be if I'm trying to lose weight and I'm not eating sugar or carbs and I go to a party and somebody throws cookies in my face and, and I pick one up and eat a cookie, then I say, oh, what the heck, I might as well just eat three or four more. But if you if you bring in your self compassion and say, Okay, I fell back a little bit, but I'm gonna get back on the horse when you bring in your self compassion after a defeat, it helps you get back in the saddle and continue on the path. What I like about your book is that I believe that your daily meditations over time can actually help to change the behavior of the reader. <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking that was a bit of psychology you threw in there, wasn't it? Oh yeah. <laughs> We all know what resilience is, but when you say writing resilience, what specifically are you talking about? Well, one of the things that happens if you're a writer is you're going to get rejection after rejection after rejection if you're trying to get published. And so resilience there would be if you get rejection, it's not necessarily about the writing. There's so many reasons why publishers write rejection letters, mm -hmm. one of which is they already have something similar or it doesn't fit with their theme or their signature of the kind of stuff they publish. But most writers, when they get a rejection, they take it so personally and get so wounded because mm -hmm. some of this writing is, is very personal. It can be even sacred. So you have to be prepared to have rhino hide uh, and let it bounce off of you and keep going. Here's a question. Yeah. Are the daily meditations standalone or is it better to read them in order? They're standalone. Um, so you can decide how you want to face the, some of the readings. Let's say you're feeling a lot of self-doubt. You can go to the back of the book and look up self-doubt and there'll be a number of readings uh, from different months. So you can focus on that particular topic. Uh, or you can, I like the idea of of both. I like the idea of reading every day and getting into the habit of just reading whatever the daily reading is. But then also, if I'm having a really bad day or a big challenge, to be able to go to the back of the book and say, I need something on rejection because I, I knew this was going to go and it didn't. And so I'm really feeling down. So I like the idea of being able to go directly to the topic because it uplifts you. That's mm -hmm. the, the one thing people keep saying. So you want to be able to use it in both in both ways to serve you. And that's actually one of the things that I really loved about the book as well. Was that the flexibility? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So during your writing process of this book, did you know specifically what meditations you wanted to include, or did they come to you over time, or was there some other type of process you used? Well. They came to me over time, really, and uh, they started with 
my own personal struggles that I was having. And then as I continued to write them, uh, I used some of my personal experiences on a day-to-day basis. Like, for example, um, I was writing a, a novel, and uh, in the middle of it, I had to run to the grocery store. And while I was there, uh, I had like $20 worth of groceries. And the cashier said, uh, she, you know, rang everything up and she said that'll be a hundred and thirty dollars and seventy five cents i said what and i looked beside me and the woman behind me her groceries had gotten all mixed up with mine she didn't put the stick between our groceries Mm. now typically i would think this is going to take and it it took 20 to 30 minutes to get all that straightened out but you know what happened is i thought i'm going to use this in the novel this is how this couple is going to meet i'm going to turn (laughs) this around and they're going to go for coffee after, uh, and because they're going to find their groceries are very similar. They both would have bought similar things. Mm-hmm. So the, the the moral to the story is, when bad things happen, things we call bad, or unfortunate situations, if you're a writer, you can take those things and use them. And when you do that, it lightens everything up. It uplifts you. And you, uh, I remember feeling... I thought, my gosh, this is great. And so I took a negative situation and used it in a positive way, and it worked so great in my novel. <laughs> Makes for a pretty interesting scene. Yeah, it really did. Uh, it's another form of empowerment, you know, and feeling good about about writing is taking a negative situation and turning it around. And as we do that, it widens our resilience zone. We start to feel more powerful. And and when I say powerful, I don't mean ego. I mean just healthy, powerful, mm-hmm. not not overpowering over other people, but being able to come on life, hit me with your best shot. Yeah. And I think that's the importance of your book and the importance of the format of your book. The fact that it's every day because you're getting that everyday reminder because we need an everyday reminder, quite frankly. Well, we do, because, again, back to that negativity bias, it's so easy because of our need for survival, for that needle to fall in the negative direction. But when you have an everyday thought that's positive and optimistic, what you start to realize is that your mind kind of stays, the needle stays over in the other direction. And you start to notice that in subtle ways, like things don't bother you as much, or you feel more confident and more serene uh, when things are thrown your way, when life throws those curveballs. So uh, you start to see it show up in your life in very subtle and sometimes big ways. Well, Brian, I really appreciate you being on the show today. It has been quite a journey to get to where you are right now in your career. In fact, what would the Brian of today tell the younger Brian who had just began his writing career? Oh, boy, wouldn't that be great if I knew (laughs) then what I know now? Wouldn't that be great for all of us if we could take that back? Uh I would say believe in yourself. Don't let the what happens outside define who you are. Find that within yourself. That that resilience is inside you. And that's kind of what I've done with my own therapy, my own understanding of who I am, my own challenges as a child growing up in an alcoholic home and having to learn to overcome the challenges of that. And I know a lot of the listeners have had their own. If not that, then similar kinds of obstacles. The thing is that, you know, if we could go back, I think most of us would say, you can do this. And it's hard, it's challenging and scary, but you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. And whatever happens is not happening to you. It's happening for you if you look at it that way. And that builds your character and your strength and your belief in yourself. Well, Brian, it was Really great speaking with you today. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you, AJ. It's been a pleasure. Where can people find you and your books online? Amazon.com, local bookstores, especially the independent bookstores, uh, all carry the book because the book was chosen as what's called an okra pick. I have to be careful how I say that. Not Oprah. Uh, People start screaming and yelling when I say okra, (laughs) O-K-R-A. But... It's a big honor uh, because they've chosen the book, and it has to be in all independent bookstores. So any independent bookstore, 
uh, as well as my uh, website. You can order it on my website, and that's brianrobinsonbooks.com, B-R-Y-A-N robinsonbooks.com. Uh, and if somebody wants to send an email to get in touch, they can reach me at brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at brianrobinsonbooks.com. Okay, fantastic. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Well, can I tell you the story of the Chinese farmer? <laughs> Absolutely. I love the story. It's a great way to end. There was a Chinese farmer who had a horse for tilling his fields. It was the most valuable thing he had because he was a very poor man. And one day that horse got loose and ran into the mountains. And all of his neighbors said, oh, what bad luck you have. This is terrible. And the farmer said, bad luck? Good luck. Who knows? And the next day, that horse came out of the mountains, leading a whole herd of wild horses behind him. And all the neighbors said, oh, what good luck you have. You're a very rich man. Well, the farmer said, good luck, bad luck. Who knows? So the next day, his son, the farmer's son, was trying to tame one of the wild horses. And he was thrown from the horse and his leg was broken. And all the neighbors said, oh, what bad luck you have. This is awful. Well, the farmer said, bad luck, good luck, who knows? So a whole month goes by, and the army comes through, and they conscript all the young men to go off to war. And it's been a bloody war, and most of the young men were killed. But the farmer's son didn't have to go because of his broken leg. Is that bad luck or good luck? Who knows? And with that, we're going to wrap up another episode. Thanks again to Brian Robinson, who taught us writing resilience today. And not only does it apply to writing, it applies to basically any endeavor you want to pursue. So if you are a writer, you definitely want to pick up this book. Having gone through the ups and downs myself, I can tell you that I wish I would have had this book sooner. (laughs) If you have any questions or comments about this episode or any, or you know an author who you think would be a good fit for the show, let me know. Connect with me on social media. I'm on Facebook, YouTube, or you can send me an email at info at ch1podcast.com. Don't forget to check out our website at ch1podcast.com. There you can find previous episodes and hopefully find your next favorite author. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. And most importantly, help us spread the word by writing a short review and telling everyone you know about the show. The Chapter One podcast is growing every single day. Believe it or not, (laughs) we've been doing the Chapter One podcast for almost two years. Yeah, there's been a lot of growth in this show (laughs) since I began in 2016. Not really sure what I was doing and still not quite sure what I'm doing. (laughs) But I remain excited because we have a lot more to offer in the years to come. That's it for me. You all stay awesome. Till next time.